Hey guys, welcome to our training for Mandated Reporters Refresher course. This course was created with sensitivity and care in mind. However, it is important to note that it may be upsetting for some individuals taking the course, especially those that are a victim of neglect or abuse. Please feel free to reach out to myself, Christy, or one of your supervisors if you feel you need to talk. In 2014, Assembly Bill 1432 required mandated reporter training for all school staff, child care employees, or contractors in programs operated by school districts and counties of Office of Education. This also includes ABA providers. This training will focus on child abuse and neglect and the proper action to take if you suspect a child is in danger. We are required to show annual proof of refresher training and mandated reporting. This course will meet the training requirements of the State of California's annual mandated reporter training. After today's training, you should be able to describe the recent changes in California's statute of limitations of sexual abuse or assault and identify the types of indicators of child abuse that must be reported. You should also be able to define legal requirements of reporting abuse and fully understand the penalty and consequences for failing to report. Finally, you will be able to recognize grooming behaviors to indicate reasonable suspicion of child sexual abuse that should be reported. California Assembly Bill 218 went into effect on January of 2020. This bill made changes to the process of childhood sexual assault cases. This bill extended the statute of limitations to the age of 40. It allows victims five years from discovery that their childhood sexual abuse resulted in an illness or psychological injury to file suit regardless of their age. It allowed to suspend the statute of limitations for three years starting in January of 2020, allowing victims of any age to file a lawsuit. It allows victims to recover three times the damages when the defendant is found to have covered up sexual assault. The fact is, whatever happens today could result in a lawsuit decades from today. Your response is a mandated reporter could prevent the sexual abuse of clients and the resulting psychological struggles they'll face in the future. Predators of sexual abuse are not the scary men who lurk around playgrounds looking for opportunities. In fact, to the Crimes Against Children's Research Center, 90% of children who are sexually abused know the predator. Predators of sexual abuse are anywhere and everywhere. They are often outgoing individuals who earn the trust of others. They could be a staff member. They could be somebody's coach, the music instructor, a teacher. They could even be an individual from the church. Sadly, a predator can even be a family member. The truth is, sexual predators can act like any other normal person. It can be difficult to pick them out. However, there are things that almost all predators have in common. They often use certain behaviors to groom a child for abuse. These behaviors are often methodical, subtle, gradual, and escalating. We refer to this as grooming behavior. We're not trying to scare you by training you on grooming behavior patterns. What we are trying to do is help you identify grooming behavior, strengthening your intuition and helping significantly lower the risk of a child being physically or sexually abused by grooming behavior. Six common grooming behaviors that everybody needs to know. One, they form relationships. Predators seek to form a relationship with children. They usually spend their spare time with children and tend to be more interested in forming relationships with the children than adults. They will single out a child as special and give them extra attention and gifts 
They will take a special interest in a child's look and dress. They may even take excessive pictures. Two, they will start to test boundaries. Predators will try to test boundaries of your child's comfort level. Sometimes they will tell off-colored and sexual jokes to see how the child will respond. They may try to play sexualized games such as petting, truth or dare, or strip games. They will take note on how the child reacts when they enter the child's room or normal places where children are expected to have privacy such as the restroom. Predators thrive in secrecy and testing boundaries. This helps them know if they can continue on without being caught. Number three, touching. Predators will test the boundaries of touching with the victim. They usually begin with non-sexual touches such as high fives or hugs. They may slowly progress into inappropriate touching such as accidentally grazing a private part of the body just to see how the victim will react. They may kiss or have the child sit on their lap. Number four, intimidating. Predators usually intimidate in order to keep the victim from telling another person about the abuse. They will begin by testing the child's reaction to being blamed for something simple. They will see if the child pushes back or tells an adult. Then they will progress to threatening the child or causing the child to feel a sense of guilt. They often use fear or embarrassment to keep the child from telling another person about the abuse. They may use statements such as nobody will believe you or threaten them with danger or danger to somebody they love to keep them from telling. Sharing sexually explicit material. Predators often share sexualized material in order to normalize sex. They will show their victims sexual pictures or videos. They often begin by sexualizing relationships through messages or texting first. Number six, communicating secretly. Predators will look for any communication channel to communicate with the victim secretly. Often these interactions will begin online. They often encourage texting, email, and all calls to be secret. Remember, predators thrive in secretivity, so they will always encourage the victim to keep silent. It's common to read these grooming behavior signs and identify people who do the same things. That doesn't automatically make them a predator. The goal is talking and being informed about these grooming behaviors and it is to strengthen your intuition and help be on alert. With that said, if you ever see these behaviors and feel like something is suspicious, you can use a strategy we call confronting with kindness to help protect the victim, confronting with kindness includes two steps, pulling the person aside and explaining the boundaries that you have established for your child and why you have them, and then asking them to support these boundaries. If the individual's behavior was innocent, then they'll be very apologetic and respect those boundaries in the future. If the individual is a predator, they will know that you're on the lookout and most likely move on mandated reporter child abuse and neglect reporting child abuse in california the term mandated reporter refers to a category of professionals who are required by law to report instances of actual or suspected child abuse and neglect the list is not limited to but includes teachers social workers police officers child care workers and clergy under state law, mandated reporters must report causes of abuse and neglect to law enforcement personnel and social service agencies, such as CPS. The report must be made within 36 hours of learning or suspecting the abuse or neglect. Examples of the child abuse and neglect under this law include sexual abuse, willful harming or injuring a minor, and or production of pornography with a minor. As to the latter, please note that the passage of Assembly Bill 1775 in 2014 
Abuse and neglect now includes the situation where a person downloads or accesses child pornography on the internet. Just to clear up any confusion, you as an ABA provider are considered a mandated reporter. This includes all and any employees that works for our agency. If a professional required to report under this statute fails to do so, that person will be charged with a misdemeanor offense. This offense is punishable by imprisonment in county jail for up to six months and or a maximum fine of $1,000. If an individual fails in their child abuse reporting duties and in an instance of abuse or neglect leads to death or great bodily harm, the person can be punished with imprisonment for up to one year in county jail and or a maximum of $5,000 fine. The intent and purpose of this statute is to protect children from abuse. We need to consider the needs of the child and any psychological harm that a minor has suffered. Child neglect is legally defined as neglectful treatment or maltreatment of a minor by a person responsible for his or her welfare. Child abuse is legally defined as any form of cruelty to a minor physically, morally, or mentally. Examples of child abuse may include sexual abuse, emotional abuse, willfully harming or injuring a child, production of child pornography, unlawful corporal punishment, domestic violence, physical abuse of a child, and death inflicted by another other than an accidental meet. Mandated reporters are also responsible to report to authorities if they know or suspect that somebody has downloaded, streamed, or accessed any child pornography on the internet. Neglect occurs when a parent of a minor willfully omits without a lawful excuse to furnish the necessary clothing, food, shelter, medical assistance, or other remedies needed for his or her child. California Penal Code 270 makes it a crime for a parent to fail to monitor or enforce a child's school attendance. Some of our clients fall under another law that protects people that are over the age of 18. This is the Elderly Abuse Dependent Adult Civil Protection Act. It provides protection for adult students that are in your care, custody, or control who are over 18. For individuals who are over 18 and have mental limitations or restrictions to his or her ability to carry out normal activities are protected. These individuals fall under our mandated reporter responsibility. If you suspect the abuse or neglect of a dependent adult in your care, it should be reported to Adult Protective Services, APS, as soon as possible. A follow-up written report should be completed and submitted within two days. Mandated reporters must report instances of sexual contact between children under the age of 18 if they suspect that the child has been sexually abused or exploited. In determining sexual abuse between children, one must consider the following factors, developmental appropriateness, what should the children of this age know about sexual contact or conduct? Was coercion, threats, or intimidation, or force involved? Were the age and size of the children involved similar? Is there a difference in emotional maturity or status? When reporting, remember that mandated reporters do not require proof, only reasonable suspicion. Reasonable suspicion means that you have obtained an objectable reason to suspect that the child has been abused based upon facts that have occurred. If you hear something, see something, or sense something, it is your duty to report it. It is not the responsibility of the mandated reporter to conduct an investigation. Only a child protective agency police or county designee can conduct an investigation of abuse. Mandated reporters
reporters who make a report of suspected child abuse to an authorized agency must give their name and contact information. California law does not allow these reporters to be confidential. During the investigation, every effort is made to keep the employee's name confidential. The identity of the reporter will only be given to the investigators that are investigating the report. However, any employee who is a mandated reporter that makes a report is not required to identify themselves to the employer. Mandated reporters have immunity from civil and criminal liability for reporting, even if that report is negligent, reckless, or intentionally false. Mandated reporters will lose their immunity if the report is provided to anybody outside of the agency in which they reported the child abuse to. You may still be required to complete an incident report on company documentation paperwork. You would only lose immunity if you gave the copy of the BCIA 8572 reporting form over to the company.